Agriculture has made the largest contribution by a significant margin to the improved growth of our economy in the second and third quarters of 2017. This year, we will take decisive action to realize the enormous economic potential of agriculture. We will pursue a comprehensive approach that makes effective use of all mechanisms at our disposal, guided by the resolutions of the 54th National Conference of the Governing Party, this approach will include the expropriation of land without compensation. To say that we stole the land, I mean, we shouldn't even take note of that. We don't want half the freedom. We want full control, rights, ownership, land of our country. The use of land as a political tool is incredibly destructive. As a result of past injustices, there is a problem now in society. Title was introduced as early as the 1600s, that is to say the 17th century. The economy of scale, there's a lot of pressure on that. History is not only the domain of historians or academics anymore. It has become a tool or even a weapon in some cases. We have no documentation right on the land. The only right that we have is the bakens. The long story is lost in the midst of time. Quite honestly, we have to reconstruct it. The land has got a failure. You cannot deny that. To the hands of the right. We remain a conquered nation because white monopoly capital still owns the means of production and at the center of that is the land question. We remain as we were even before 1994. It is only through the expropriation of land without compensation that our people will be the rightful owners of this country. We cannot keep on saying South Africa belongs to all who live in it, yet we have nothing to show. If you vote against this, it's a waste of time. We are already giving our people the land and we are not ashamed of that. People of South Africa, where you see a beautiful land, take it, it belongs to you. After the implosion of the white minority government and the advent of a national democracy in South Africa, the country has experienced a fair amount of economic growth. The economic growth that followed as a result of South Africa's reintroduction into the international marketplace is often attributed to the efficacy of the ANC government, since the ANC happened to preside over the system that oversaw the process. All the while, the ANC insisted on enforcing a national democratic revolution, which implies an aggressive centralization of power in the state, the erosion of private property rights, and a severe restriction on economic freedom. During the presidency of Jacob Zuma and his deputy Cyril Ramaphosa, the ANC declared that it was ready for a second transition in the revolution. According to the ANC, the first wave of its revolution was the attainment of control of the state, while the second wave implies the utilization of state mechanisms to achieve the goals of the revolution, which would ultimately lead to the creation of a socialist state in South Africa. This is pursued under the banner of radical economic transformation. He studies the history, he will understand how it came about. And after all, if that's what he really believes, why, why not apply that also to other parts of the world where white people came after the indigenous people that were already there, like America? I wonder if they really believe that the white people in America should go back to Europe, or white people in Australia. Do they think that's feasible? So if they say no, they don't think so. Why then, why then make it applicable to South Africa, to the white people of South Africa? It's a fact that land must be returned back to those who are landless. White people who own land in South Africa today are all beneficiaries of land theft, a crime against humanity that was committed on our black ancestors. This year they want land to be redistributed to the people. Also many young people are migrating to urban cities. We must be able to have means to expropriate land that will enable them to reside and in well-located land where they can go and walk to work. Our people are in need of land where they can build their homes and where they can farm and where they can also build facilities for various amenities. And a number of these places are strewn right across the length and the breadth of our country. And some of them are in urban areas. It, there is no, it makes no sense 
to give land to people that do not have the expertise, the training, the education to use land. There has been an attempt to take land and just give it to people that have no knowledge whatsoever. I think we must be careful when we talk about history. Politicians love to give a one-sided view on history. They thrive off it. Our current politicians love the idea that the whites came in and stole all the land, now they must give it back. And they work on this, cuts deep in emotions on both sides. On the side of the blacks who then look at you and, and think of you as having stolen their land. Or on the side of whites who are saying you're calling me a thief. This is political rhetoric. The best thing would be to shelve that and try and move away from it. But unfortunately, the exposure to this thinking, you know, it's constantly just goes on and go on and on. You know, it's as if the world was created just a few minutes after the Africans or the black man arrived in Africa. What happened prior to that, prior to that, prior to that? This world is much older since the arrival of Jan van Riebeek. We know that people moved. We know that the Africans moved down from the northern part of Africa. This is political rhetoric for short-term political gain. History is never as simple as that. It's nuanced. There are all kinds of stories attached to the land. Wherever you go in South Africa and you delve back deeply enough into history, you find a different story. After the inauguration of President Cyril Ramaphosa, Parliament adopted a motion that the state should be empowered to expropriate private property without compensation. The policy position was motivated by the underlying notion that white people are illegitimate landowners and that white-owned land has to be expropriated and transferred to black people. There are, however, three major problems with this position. Firstly, it is an ahistoric view that doesn't take cognizance of how white landowners acquired their land. Secondly, it is based on the false presupposition of a hunger for rural land among black people. Thirdly, while it is claimed that this position would strengthen the economy, it is fundamentally based on the erosion of property rights, aggressive state control and central planning over the economy, all of which have served as the ingredients for the most catastrophic economic collapses of the 20th century. Well, in South African terms, it has come to our shores through the alliance between the African National Congress and the South African Communist Party. But if you listen to this term, uh, you can hear it has a Cold War sound to it because it is in essence a revolution, a revolution driven on the basis of a class struggle that comes from a communist orientation and it aims at overturning the current economic structures. And that is why the ANC and the SACP has for a very long time promoted the nationalization of banks, the nationalization of land. They mean a complete reorganization of society along the lines of their ideology, which has been their DNA for some time now. It boils down to centralizing power in the hands of the state and directing uh, the patterns of property rights distribution, of human settlement uh, across society. I just think radical economic transformation is part of the ANC's uh, Marxist socialist agenda. I, I don't think that there's anything um, much else to it other than they want to increase state ownership over resources, over land, over key nodes of the economy. When they talk about radical economic transformation, it's really code language for increased state control over the economy. You need a government that will be strong and straight and will push the socialist and communist kind of governing, which will make sure that the land and the economy of the country benefits the majority. When they say radical economic transformation, they specifically want to zoom in on the economy, the distribution of ownership, and even intervention within specific companies to organize how they manage their production processes and how they link up with other companies. It's basically thinking of society in terms of state direction of the economy based on old socialist ideas, uh, some technocratic socialism, as well as a, a strong dose of racial engineering. First of all, we must understand in South African law, you can only steal immovable objects. So you cannot physically ever be convicted of the crime of stealing land. But it is a term often used by politicians with reference to the apartheid era. They mean the dispossessions and all of that, but it's not physical stealing. So it is an unfortunate concept because it has a political undertone but it's not the correct legal term. Of course, the Constitution does not say you can take this land without 
compensation. It actually says that it's got to be done with compensation. For instance, you can, as government, take land and make it available for building roads. If you wanted to build roads, you can approach individuals to say, we want a certain portion of your land because we want to build a road here for general use of the people of the country. Section 25 of the Constitution has what we call a negative guarantee. It doesn't say anyone is entitled to property. It says no one may be deprived of property except under a law of general application. If you have property, it is protected to some extent. The pity is that I think agriculture is an economic process and you should apply the market principles to make sure that it bring the, up the best farmer to, to produce food for a country. The ANC governments do have an ideological and political agenda and they make use of the land as a political tool for them to gain votes. And that is very complicated because at the end of the day food security is in stake and you are going to lose production value. And that is at present the reality because almost 95% of the not even aggressive transfer of land at this stage go out of production. This is a very complicated issue and I think it's very irresponsible of a government to have that approach. The South African government has adopted different programs as part of its land reform plan. The first is a program of restitution, according to which people whose ancestors or communities have been deprived of land can file land claims in order to receive compensation, either in the form of financial compensation or obtaining the land. The second is a broad process of redistribution with the aim of enforcing equality regarding land ownership on a racial basis. This process involves government buying land from white people in the open market and redistributing the land to black beneficiaries. The term redistribution is however misleading as this process is followed regardless of how white landowners obtain their land and whether any community was dispossessed on that land. The second phase of the National Democratic Revolution imposes the ideology that land shouldn't be bought from white people but expropriated without compensation. This is born of a misunderstanding. Most of the people that ask for land, they don't want land because they want to farm. Because if you want to make money out of land, you need a lot of training and education. A lot of our people that are asking for land, they want land, residential land. And that's a different thing from wanting a farm. We do know cases where some, in the case where they were offered uh, land over money, they took the money. I mean, even Tabo Beggy has talked yeah, about this, saying that of it's cases. important that perhaps black people would not be so enticed to take the money, but rather take the land. Yeah, 93 percent of them have said, we don't want land, we want money. We want the money. Seven percent said, yes, I'd like the land. Ninety-three said no. But this is exactly the problem with the type of thinking that we have. So now we have the state president coming at the State of the Nation address saying, we are angry with you because you say you want money. We want you to want land. Don't say to us that you want money. Come back and say, no, you want land. So they are prescribing to black people how they should think. The vast majority of correct. black people... <laughs> So you should prescribe to black yes, people how they yes. should think. A lot of ANC thinking is grounded in you know, Marxist-Leninist, Soviet-style thinking. Obviously, you know, softened and, and tempered for a, for a 21st century social democracy age. The other country that the ANC really like to look to these days is China. So the ANC looks towards these countries and takes, I think, the wrong lessons from China and uh, certainly uh, all the wrong lessons from, from Soviet Russia. These, are, these form a lot of the intellectual bedrock of how the ANC, uh, of what drives ANC policy. And then I think if you, you could layer over that tribal feudal thinking where land is in particular controlled by chiefs and people live on tribal land with no specific individual property rights ownership, that um, notion dovetails very nicely with the notions of communism and a lack of private property ownership and so overall this guides ANC thinking in the direction of disregarding the importance of private property rights. The ANC doesn't like a decentralized power, it wants centralized power, centralized control, it wants to make decisions. When you read their strategy and tactics documents, the goal is more and more state control and so they would like to see clean communism uh, rather than corrupt communism. My contention is that communism ultimately tends to be corrupt communism because you create the perfect environment for corruption when you, when you institute a, a system of centralized state control.
when you read about how it thinks about the country, it sees South Africa as a big social experiment and it sees ordinary people on the ground as subjects to be experimented upon. Uh, and that's very consistent with Marxist-Leninist thinking, with totalitarian thinking, that societies are just social experiments for the intellectual and political elite to experiment upon. What we also have in the rural areas, in particularly what used to be the former homelands, we have land in communal ownership, which is formally vested in the traditional tribal authorities, but where ordinary individuals have customary use rights. They have plots which have been allocated to their families sometimes for generations, which they have the right to use. But again, it's an informal right, and they don't have any kind of legal title, which means that they are vulnerable to having the land taken from them and reallocated to somebody else by the traditional leader. It's a very powerful indication that if you want prosperity, you must protect property rights as part of economic freedom in the real sense, not the sort of distortion that Julius Malema and the economic freedom fighters here try to portray as, as the essence of economic freedom. There's no question that to do just about anything productive, you need a place to do it. In that sense, we need space and land and property. That forms the means of production, if you like. So that's how we produce and build wealth. So a lot of land is, is very important to the wealth creation process. The problem is that land has come to be seen as the sole means and, and, and uh, mechanism of wealth creation. And that is a, an erroneous uh, understanding uh, it's, it's a false understanding of, of the importance of land uh, in, in the economic process. I think is unfortunately being sold as a concept in South Africa as a solution to poverty, wealth inequality, and I don't think that that's a constructive approach to the problem. I think that there are far more important things to fix in the, in the political economy of South Africa to enhance uh, people's uh, prospects, to, to raise incomes, to create employment and all these good things. Other areas of the country which are water scarce, which comprise a lot more than half of South Africa, 55% of the country, is water poor to the extent that pastoralists wouldn't be able to survive in it. I think that very often we make the terrible mistake of judging what's going on now, then trying to superimpose it on the past. That's a, a fundamental blunder. We know that if you looked at the first national census for South Africa, the total country population was only 6 million. You think of the increase from 6 million to 55 million. The different Bantu-speaking tribes originated in what is now Cameroon and they basically moved down towards the Great Lakes area, splitting into two groups. The one went towards what is now Namibia and the other via Mozambique into southern Africa. This occurred around 300 AD. The country was very sporadic. It didn't happen on one event. They didn't have a history to prove why they came. So whatever people wrote about that migration is basically speculation. They clashed maybe with other tribes, became overpopulated in certain countries in Central Africa. Before the white people came, a lot of these tribes didn't settle permanently on one piece of land. They moved about because the land was there. These came down and the ones that went east of the Dragonsburg, the languages there mutated into what we call Nguni today. And uh, west of that is the Sutu languages that came this side. That migration didn't happen overnight. It could have taken three centuries of gradually moving south. So they arrived in the Cape, more or less where the Fisher River is today. And that was the Kosa people, Nguni tribe. They arrived there not long before the white people arrived in South Africa. So when the whites started moving up the coast, the east coast, they met the black people more or less where the Fish River is. I would say the black people probably arrived in the Eastern Cape in the mid 16th century. They found other Africans living here. What we now know were Khoi and the Sun. These people occupied these territories that we now all know, whether it is KZN, Free State, Lesotho, all these territories going that way. Most tribes settled on the east coast, and the west coast was mainly inhabited by the Khoi and the Sun. In retrospect, they might now say the, the land did belong to us, but of course, they, they didn't have formal land ownership as we know it today. But yes, surely, and I think the white people respected that, 
or most of them at least, between that mountain and the sea, or the mountain and that river, that belongs to the Zulu. But the people, the individuals amongst the Zulu, and that can go for all the tribes in Africa, they didn't see themselves as owning that little piece, but the tribe owned it, yeah. So that it was communal land ownership in the name of the, of the king. The Khoisan people are the indigenous people of southern Africa. And as these Bantu-speaking people moved southwards, they had Iron Age technology. So obviously they were much more advanced than the Stone Age technology that the Khoisan had at that stage. So through various conflicts between the two, they were in effect dispersed throughout the rest of the country. They moved into the mountainous and semi-desert areas because of the conflict with the Bantu-speaking people. <laughs> Hier moet ik praat uit een, uit, een, uit een pijn en hart zeer. Als ik mijn ambtelijkheid heb, moet ik mezelf kunnen helpen. Ik moet naar mijn mensen behoefte kunnen omzien. Ik moet naar het boodschap kunnen luisteren. Ik moet bij de huizen kunnen omgaan. Ik moet naar de toestand kunnen zien. Maar ik is een vreemdeling in mijn eigen land. Wat wordt van mijn kinderen? Wat wordt van mijn kleinkinderen? Wat wordt van mijn volk? Wat wordt van die boesma gemeenschap? Wat wordt van de culturele rechten? Wat wordt van de grondrechten? Ons is onder een scherm. Ons wordt toegemaakt. Administrateur is boer, hof is boer, procureurs als lands en ons is die voetvelen. En we praat mooie boodschappen aan die wereld, wat er leen is. Grond is die fundament van die boesman. Grond is die testament van die boesman. Grond is die woning van die boesman. Grond is die land van die boesman. En hij respect. Kom ons lief niet. They were pushed into that arid part of the land by the blacks and the whites after the black people. And they, I mean, they, they slaughtered them. And there's various references to how the black people treated the Khoi and the sun, especially the sun, and also the white people when they came in. The Khoi and the sun generally were nomadic. They moved from place to place, and they enjoyed the prosperity territory that was fertile. But as we arrived in these big formations, they got to be driven out of there, defeated, taken over. Many of them incorporated, but many others ran away. No human beings, if you think carefully, no human beings would have chosen to live in dry territories like the Kalahari, when there was a whole territory that had plenty of water. We began to dispossess and to take these territories and so on. We are actually the second arrivals. I'm talking about the Bantu sections. Are the second arrivals and not the first and original that have been and so on. The Dutch East India Company was founded in the Netherlands. So their main aim was to establish trade with the East, importing spices, fabrics and such to Europe. So their interest specifically in Southern Africa was to establish a refreshment station at the Cape of Good Hope. The reason for this was that the Suez Canal was not built at that stage yet. So they had to take the long way around, around the Cape to reach the East. The very first white people that landed here were not even coming to South Africa. They were going to the East Indies for other purposes. The journey to the Cape from Europe was about three months. So they would need fresh food and fresh water and even have a place to tend their sick. So by 1652, the Dutch East India Company sent Jan van der Rebeek to establish this refreshment station. Before the advent of West, there was no title. You couldn't say, this is my farm. There was no land bought and sold. People just settled on the land and if they wanted to move on, they moved on. With the introduction of title, which came from Europe because of the feudal system in Europe, people then started this process. What we should realize is that the Dutch East India Company had laws preventing the enslavement of local peoples wherever the refreshment stations or the trading posts were situated. What we do know is that in 1658 they imported a boatload of slaves. In ancient history, the Greeks, as Greek enslaved Greek, Roman enslaved Roman. If you owed me money and we were both Romans or Greeks, I could sell you into slavery to get my money. Slavery started, had nothing to do with racism. It started as a system. And they found that, but these are, are Africans like us, but they are not like us. They speak in a manner 
in a way that is different from us. For instance, Ba Borwa, of the South. So we arrived here, the Bantu speaking sections of the population, in bigger formation. We made bigger and better weapons than them. There's no doubt at all that uh, fundamental schism in South Africa in those days would have been between two groups, hunter-gatherers and pastoralists. There's all the evidence that shows that they were in conflict right from the word go. And uh, this caused, we know, terrific difficulties between the San and the Khoi Khoi. And later on was to cause enormous difficulties between the San and the black African groups that had moved out down from Central Africa, who were definitely not going to tolerate hunters poaching their livestock. There was war between different tribes in this country before the advent of whites. Very many, there's a period in our history that's called Difakani. It was a generalized war. Other tribes defeated others and they took them over, they took their properties and so on. As the settlements expanded towards the east, the need for land increased. Eventually, white settlers, who would later become known as the Boers or the Afrikaners, met with Khoza settlers on the eastern frontier. Initially, a border was created between the Boers and the Khozas, but the border was disregarded by both parties, resulting in eight border wars between white and black settlers. The settlers living on the eastern frontier were mainly from Dutch and German descent, so they came with the Dutch East India Company and they had a very specific culture to the British. The interesting thing about Hendrik Bibo is that he was the first European to actively associate himself with Africa instead of Europe, and this already occurred in 1707. He was a 17-year-old boy running through the streets of Stellenbosch, being chased by the magistrate because he had been unruly. And as the magistrate was attempting to give him a hiding, in effect, he shouted that you're not allowed to eat me, ek ben an Afrikaner, meaning I am an Afrikaner. He saw himself superior to the magistrate who was Dutch born while he was South African born. And this is interesting and this is a watershed moment basically because now the, a group of people actively started associating themselves with Africa. People from Europe that settled in Africa decided to turn their back to Europe and turn their face towards Africa and took a deliberate decision that they did not see their future in Europe that they saw themselves as Africans. And it's now already a few hundred years later, it's already a situation where Afrikaners has been here for many generations. And that's why it's unfortunate that you still have people not seeing Afrikaners as Africans. In the early 19th century, a severe power struggle developed amongst different black tribes in Southern Africa, which eventually resulted in what became known as the Mfakane or Difakwane. This was mainly the result of the expansionist wars by Zulu King Shaka and the reign of Mzilikazi, King of the Ndebele, also known as the Matabele. By 1815, a wave of destruction unmatched in South African history was released. Zulus, they had a lot of fight with different tribes. So we may name them, but there were so many tribes that uh, fought with the Zulus, but the Zulus, they emerged and they defeat all the, all the wars. Ms. Likazi basically came to the forefront as one of the generals of Shaka. And Shaka sent him in an expedition against the Sutu to the interior to raid cattle. He returned and Shaka asked tribute of him wanting to receive some of the cattle. Ms. Likazi did not, well, basically challenge Shaka's authority and Shaka sent two expeditions against him with the second one finally resulting in Ms. Likazi fleeing northwards, taking about 300 of his men with him. As he fled northwards, he basically took in other tribes or conquered them and incorporated them into his own numbers. By 1830, he occupied and he ruled over almost the entire area north of the Vol River. So he was a very powerful warrior with large tracts of land under his control. So by the end of the Mfukane, which lasted more than a decade, it is estimated that only the Venda remained in their original position. The rest of the tribes had been dispersed, some of them fleeing as far north as Tanzania and Zambia to get away from the carnage. In addition, about up to two million people were killed during these wars, which is a significant number of the people living in Southern Africa at that stage. If you think of the 1911 census, there were only four million black people in South Africa. The Cape was annexed by the British in 1795, which initiated friction between the Boers and the British that would last for more than a century. 
the subsequent colonization of the Cape by the British was one of the many factors that led to the Great Trek of 1838. The four trackers then had what they called the commission track that went into the interior to look what the situation was and they found vast open spaces which was left open because of the Mfekane where there were tribal wars that made people flee the central part of South Africa. The commission track were actually three tracks that moved out of the Cape initially. Their main aim was to establish if there was open land for a viable settlement of the people wanting to move out of the Cape Colony. The one in Natal is significant as it was led by Piet Ais. Upon arrival in Natal, he negotiated with Tungan for a piece of land between the Tugela and Unzimbubu rivers, which they intended to settle. Tungan actually agreed to this, even at that early stage. And upon his return, he communicated this with other potential food trackers at that stage still. And that is why they chose Natal initially. Retief was the first democratically elected leader in Southern Africa because he was the first governor elected by the Fuertrakers. And in this position he went to Dengan in Atal to ask him for the piece of land that Piet Ais had originally agreed with Dengan for. And this was to establish a republic for the Fuertrakers. Dengan agreed on the condition that he recover his cattle from Sikonyela who had raided their kraal. Piet Retief did this. They sent an expedition and recovered the cattle and even got some extra for Dengan. Upon their return, Dingan signed the treaty that they could occupy the piece of land between the Tugela and Umzimvuba rivers. But a couple of days later, unfortunately, Dingan ordered his warriors to kill the whole delegation. They had them tied and beaten to death as Bitratif watched. Um, he was the last to be killed. A couple of months later only that they find their skeletal remains and the saddlebag containing the treaty between Dingan and Bitratif. Both parties had signed it, so it meant that that area of land was officially the property of the Fuertrakers. Dungan, shortly after Retief's murder, he sent about six to 7,000 of his warriors out to exterminate all the Fuertrakers that was within the boundaries of Natal. They attacked in the night and killed more than 500 people in that single night, most of them women and children, and the servants that accompanied the Fuertrakers on the Great Track. After the murder of Retief and the massacres at Blokrans and Viennen, Andres Pretorius was elected to replace Retief as leader. Pretorius' commando of 464 found themselves surrounded by a Zulu army of about 12,000 men. Against all odds, the Zulu army was defeated at the Battle of Blood River, after which the Fuertrekkers went on to establish the Republic of Natalia based on the treaty between Retief and King Dingan. As the events unfolded on Retief and Pretorius' expedition in Natal, another trek under the leadership of Hendrik Pochita was attacked by the Ndebele of Mzilikazi. The attack was averted at the Battle of Fechkop. Pochita, along with a number of supporting black tribes who had been displaced by Mzilikazi, then entered Mzilikazi's territory to initiate a counterattack. Pochita, along with some of the other black chiefs that were dispersed due to Mzilikazi's wars, sent an expedition out against him and they basically dispersed in Debele and they had to flee. So the Fuertrakers were by right of conquest the new owners of this area of land. What happened then is that Hendrik Pothieter allowed his allies that fought on his side to occupy the, the land that they had previously held within north of the Transvaal that Nzilikazi had sent them away from. So it's interesting to note that the Fuertrakers in allegiance with many of the black tribes fought against what we can now say was a tyrant that basically killed their families and led them to leave their homelands. In our tradition, if you are being conquered, then that land belongs to me, even though people belong to me. If I come and fight you and I conquer you, then you must know I'm taking over that land and I'm taking over your people. You must follow me wherever I go and I will be a ruler there because you are defeated. That's how it works long time ago. White people knew that this part of the land was occupied by a certain tribe. But you know, again, because the black people didn't have that concept of owning land, they didn't see it as a permanent sort of arrangement. All over Europe, or uh, uh, all over the world, in fact, uh, the land that they then took was seen as spoils of war. It was yours. You'd, you won the war, you take it. It happened in Europe, it happened in America, and all over, even in Australia. 
The Matabili today don't live in South Africa anymore. They moved the Limpopo River into Zimbabwe, which they conquered from the Shonas that lived there before. Especially the allies of Hendrik Potgieter in his war against Mzlikatsi, all of them received their land back. Um, one of the groups even received a great stretch of land that stretched from Tong to, to modern-day Mafeking. To say that all this ground was taken by conquest is absolutely untrue. If you work it out, it comes to certain areas of South Africa and it's a minority of the ground. Ironically today, just about all of it is under land claims now. After the conclusion of the Great Trek, the Fuhr Trekkers established several republics. This included the Zeit Afrikaanse Republic, which was also known as the Transvaal Republic and the Republic of the Orange Free State. These republics were, however, soon targeted as a result of British expansionism, which led to the First Anglo-Boer War in 1880. Within four months, the British were defeated by the Boers. The Second Anglo-Boer War was declared in 1899, but this time on a much larger scale. After the British captured the capitals of the Transvaal Republic, as well as the Republic of the Orange Free State, the Boers resorted to guerrilla warfare, resulting in several decisive victories in the field. In response, the British initiated a scorched earth policy through which Boer farms were burnt to the ground. The wives and children of Boers, as well as thousands of black people, were captured and sent to concentration camps, where tens of thousands died an agonizing death. As a result, more women and children were killed during the Second Anglo-Boer War than Boer and British soldiers combined. After the British victory, the Union of South Africa was formed in 1910 with the unification of the various British colonies and Boer republics. The Union of South Africa was an internal, self-governing, autonomous dominion of the British Empire. The controversial Natives Land Act was introduced in 1913. The big mistake, I think, that was made in the 1913 Land Act was to make it so rigid. It allowed ownership in certain areas for certain race groups only. As a black, you could own ground, but only in certain places and as a white did the same apply. And the problem was it wasn't flexible enough to cope with an enormous growth in population. It is a fact that it is impossible to survive on more than 30% of South Africa's land surface without the necessary technology to dig boreholes for life-giving water. And land reform activists are therefore falsely arguing that black people occupied 100% of South Africa's surface before the arrival of white people. In line with this reasoning, it is widely believed that the Natives Land Act of 1913 resulted in large-scale dispossessions and forced removals of black people in order to move them to areas that comprised only 13% of South Africa's surface. What is not said, however, is that the Bowman Commission found at the time that black people occupied only about 12% of South Africa's surface and that the areas that were designated to black tribes, according to the 1913 Land Act, were largely a reflection of where black people already resided. Another controversial piece of legislation was the Group Areas Act of 1950, which was built on the provisions of the 1913 Act. This act was championed by the Minister of Native Affairs, Hendrik Verwoerd, who later became the South African Prime Minister. We should, well now, we, now many people say that Verwoerd is the architect of apartheid, but it's a very simplistic way of looking at Verwoerd. I think Verwoerd was a philosopher. He had an ideal that he wanted to reach, and this ideal was to establish a country that was very much like Europe, the makeup of different countries with borders next to each other, but who had different cultures, different languages, and in each country people could develop along their own lines. And Verwoerd had the same dream for South Africa. He wanted to enable the different groups in South Africa to be governed by their own people, to study in their own language and develop along their own lines of their own cultures. So for Wurt's idea was not necessarily to separate the races because he saw one group as inferior to the other. He wanted to separate the races because he wanted them to be able to develop to their utmost potential within their own community. A process of forced dispossessions and transferals was initiated in the 20th century, which is regarded by many as the most controversial act of the white minority government. This process made provision for the creation of a variety of nation states for different tribes in South Africa. This was motivated by the government as a push for the improvement of living conditions and the establishment of self-determination for different peoples. While it is often argued by land reform activists that these dispossessions were merely a form of government brutality and oppression, 
An investigation into the history of these dispossessions reveals that the true picture is much more complicated. A set of minimum requirements was developed by the state which had to be complied with before any such program could be initiated. These included the sufficient establishment of water supply, sanitary facilities, housing at a certain minimum standard, medical clinics, school facilities, grocery stores, access to roads. New towns to which black urban groups were moved were developed into semi-independent border towns in white areas with the goal of allowing for black workers to commute for work. Newly established black areas and border towns presided over all the facilities provided to white areas and was largely an improvement on the areas from which they were moved. Black people were also compensated during these dispossessions. Land that was in private black ownership was bought and compensation was paid for alterations to the property. While it is often argued that no notice of dispossession was given to black people, an investigation again reveals that history was not that simple. As an alternative to written notices, meetings were organized with local communities and committees were established on which local stakeholders could serve in order to assist with the process. After the dispossession, new committees were established with local stakeholders as a measure to ensure the necessary communication channels in order to find solutions to problems which arose as a result of the dispossession. Housing and food were provided to those affected. In 1960, Favut initiated a referendum which led to South Africa departing from the British Commonwealth, steering it to become the Republic of South Africa. The anti-apartheid movement, however, kept gaining ground after the banning of various anti-apartheid movements under the Suppression of Communism Act of 1950. After a fierce power struggle between rival organizations, the African National Congress, backed by the Soviet Union, was able to establish itself as a de facto representative of black people and became the impersonation of the struggle to bring the apartheid system to a fall. The system imploded in 1990 when President F. W. de Klerk revoked the banning of the ANC and other communist-aligned organizations, effectively signaling the end of apartheid. The first non-racial national democratic election took place in 1994, leading to the advent of ANC rule in South Africa. In 1996, the Department of Land Affairs, as I think it was called at that point, said that the government owned or controlled 26% of the land in the country. It was taking account of the land which had been owned by the state itself, which was about 12% in 1994. It was also taking account of the land in the homelands, which was always about 13% of South Africa's land area. And that was land which had been always controlled by the traditional authorities and ultimately vested in the state. So it still ultimately was state land. That immediately brought it up to 25%. They thought 26% taking account of various other factors and if you added in municipal land which was subsequently put at about 2 million hectares then the overall amount was was probably at about 27 percent in 1996. Then the next land audit that came out in 2013 said the state had only 14 percent of South Africa's land area which was a very odd figure because somehow they seemed to have dropped all the state land that used to be owned and a lot of the homeland land. If anything, they were talking only about the land which had been in the homelands and not about the land which had been in state ownership. Very strange figure. Then, more recently, they brought out another land audit which was supposed now to look at privately owned land. And they said that they looked at the deeds registry in particular as a source of information. And then they assigned a racial ownership where they could, using data held by other government agencies. And they also came to the conclusion that about 61% of land in South Africa is owned by companies and by various forms of collective ownership and they said it's not possible to assign a racial identity to these sorts of organizations. So we won't try to do it. We'll only look at privately owned land, which is owned by individuals. So their land audit immediately left out account 61% of privately owned land in the country, which is a major problem and which the ANC keeps failing to acknowledge when it talks about the results of that land audit. It said in the relation to commercial farmland that black South Africans own 4% of that. Now, it's difficult to know whether that is accurate. It's a shockingly low figure, but it may also reflect the fact that it's been the ANC's policy for many years to make sure that black people would not attain private title to land. If it's restitution land, it's gone to communal property associations or traditional authorities. If it's redistribution land, it's mostly been held by the state. So naturally, the figure for privately owned black land is lower 
than it might be if the government had not had policies of this kind. But the biggest flaw is that we simply don't know about the racial ownership of 61% of the land in the country. And AgriSA has also compiled figures which paint a very different picture. And they did assign a racial identity to companies and trusts and so on. And they did so primarily by looking at surnames and geographical information. And they were cautious. They said if they couldn't be clear that this was black ownership, then they assigned it to white ownership. And on that basis, they came to the conclusion that black ownership of land which is owned or controlled by the government or previously disadvantaged individuals amounts to 27% of the land in South Africa on the whole. But if you look also at land potential, what is the most valuable land in the country in terms of its carrying capacity, the well-watered land in the eastern seaboard, which for obvious reasons has always been the land most held and occupied by Africans, then it goes up to 46% or 47% if you round it up, which is held either by the state or previously disadvantaged individuals. And that's more likely to be a more accurate figure, but it's been discounted by the government, particularly now in the debate about whether we need expropriation without compensation. It obviously serves the government's purposes to focus on the 4% of commercial farmland in black ownership and to discount all the many problems in that figure. I honestly believe, in my experience through the years of handling land claims, I came to the conclusion that more than 90% of the people, or at least that are beneficiaries, don't make a success of the farming simply because they shouldn't have been granted a piece of land. The land is not a good place. I have here with you in 2003. You ask me, you give a man 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 no, but I don't understand. The money for the of the armistice. I ask the man, do you have a land to build? Do you have a man who has a skin to be found? Do you have a two days? He has a two days for the sale of the wine. And he makes four and he buys flies. The end of the week, he has all the ten days to be sold. So there is nothing we are dealing with a very different country today than what we had, let's say, back in 1913. It's a country that's now urbanised. Soon 75% of our population are going to be living in, in our metropolitan collective urban areas. 75% of the population will therefore not be able to produce enough food to sustain themselves. We have to look very hard at how we are going to retain an, a rural sector that can actually produce sufficient food for the urban sector in this country. And that's why it's absolutely imperative that whatever government tackles, whatever land reform initiatives they want to tackle, to carry out their constitutional duties, has to be very careful that they also balance that with the necessary production to keep the urban areas alive. Because if they don't do that, the country will be plunged into anarchy anyway. I don't think that there's any real hunger for farming land. There is a great need for housing to be made available in the urban areas, but that's a different sort of debate. What the ANC has been seeking to do for a long time is to use the land injustices of the past as a wedge issue so that it can get closer to achieving an objective which is very close to its heart which is to eliminate existing property rights. But from the land, the ANC can move to many other types of property. And there's also a, a fundamental, really fraudulent claim at the heart of the ANC's promise of redress. Because when it says it's going to expropriate without compensation, so as to give land back to the people, what it's really talking about is that the state will end up as the owner of all that land. And it's the ANC's policy not to give black people title, to land, so they have nothing with which they can go to the banks for collateral, which sets them up even more for failure. And this explains, at least in part, why so many of the land reform projects have failed. When the ANC says that it really cares about returning land to the people, that it wants to provide in redress for past injustices, this is simply really a cloak that's being thrown over its intentions to give the state the ownership and control of land in South Africa, and perhaps from land any number of other kinds of property as well.
I, I realized the, the journey now. I just came into farming, but not realizing there's a challenge after all. I'm suffering uh, uh, to stand on my feet towards a commercial level because of several. That's why by now I, I try to diverse in a way, but it's, it's a little bit hardship. And, but all in all, I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a full time farmer. I, I got everything here, but I don't know, the link with our government is not so, 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 so conducive whereby I can see myself up. I'm struggling especially with the implements. Government trying to help, yes, but uh, different people with different programs. They, they can give somebody a tractor while somebody's not having uh, an agricultural idea. And then you're killing, you're killing the, 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 the esteem of other farmers who are emerging around the place. You're killing the, the, the perseverance that I got. Last year I nearly dropped this whole thing and go back to Texas. It's then by now I see the, the government trying to, to link me. I end up going, having grant, but it wasn't full package of grant. I was supposed to get the diesel, seeds, chemicals, heavy side stuff and gunsmiths. I only got two things, elements. I got the diesel, I got the seeds. The rest, they say the, the government doesn't have money. In our case, it's, it's, it's the department. They come to the community, they come to the people, they promise things, they promise people things they cannot do. So at the end, we end up failing. As the committees, we end up failing the projects, so people think we are failing them, whereas we are failed by the department. Uh, we identified the problem of uh, the challenge rather than the problem of, of land reform some 15 years back, that it's something that needs to happen, uh, but something that needs to happen in a controlled environment. And that's why we got involved in land reform to achieve it on our own terms and not on terms that's been forced down to us by politicians. We felt it was important to, to continue and to persevere for the benefit of our children because we couldn't find an environment where all communities could prosper together. There was not going to be a future. In 2007, we were approached with uh, some fellow farmers that had a project that they were working on and contemplating, but they couldn't fill in the, the business side. And being a agricultural economist by education, a uh, farmer by calling, uh, they asked our involvement and we put together a business model which we felt had a sustainable future. I'm here in a farm. It's a communal property. Everybody of this community is a beneficiary. It's, it's a transpass, it's a headache. Farming nearer to, to, to community. I'm in a farm, it's vandalized, I'm willing to upgrade, I cannot. I'm nearer to, to, to communal. I cannot run things, crime. It happens to me to lose 1,000 liters of diesel this season, previous season. Wherever it costed me, I, I sold two heifers of Simbras to buy another diesel. So that's a drawback. So it, 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 it's right if sometimes we got the help on maybe getting farms to, to hire. You know, we don't get any subsidies for many years now from the government. So uh, agriculture doesn't get any subsidies, except for uh, a, a smallish subsidy on, on diesel. That, that's what we get. So you need to be profitable. And obviously with the decline in the value of our currency, it sometimes makes it very difficult. Yes, on exports you gain, but you know, as you know, the RAND is, is, uh, at this present moment is strengthening and it makes it unbelievably difficult. Uh, yeah, I, I got, uh, it's just the profile, NDP, a national development profile that they, they make to me from the government. As in, I'll receive seeds. As in, I'll receive uh, help up to farms. But it's five years now. Since I've, I've got five years, I applied for a farm. Till now. That's the only thing. Um, yeah, it's my brand make. But after I started to buy my six Simbras, the, 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 the letter for, 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 from uh, agriculture and forest in fisheries. 
for marking them. And then this is a, a contract a proposal for, my, for the contract that I'm using, using now, uh, Vian Koti. Yeah, he's the man that he's mentoring me, he's helping me with this. Um, what I am with that man. He's a white man, but he's helping the poor farmers here around. I don't believe government should be involved because even government himself doesn't know how to run farms. They should leave farms to people who know how to run them. Everything we are doing is successful, not because we know better. It's because we have commercial farmers from Melmoth. They are helping us a lot. We are not doing it on our own because when we got the farms, we had nothing. We didn't know where to start. And then our Nkosi went and found us help. Where the department they came, they promised to help us with the legal. They had their legal member. They had everyone who was going to help us. But they attended only two meetings and after that, they vanished. If our kids grow up believing in what we are believing in now, the relationships we have made with the commercial farmers, if they will continue to carry on that, then we will have a successful generation. We have a program in Kulini of transformation, of uplifting our town in Kulini, as well as Tlapulugang next door. A lot of role players are involved in this planning of over three years of, of rehabilitation of the environment and uh, to open the potential that is surrounding Kulini. And part of the potential as I identify it together with these role players is this 12,000 12, hectares of, of uh, agricultural land. And to get this in production, it will make a difference to our community. But uh, this is now a blockation. Nobody wants to become involved and nobody really knows why the system the government follows is not working. They want to get more land in South Africa. But what of trying to set this land that is available, like where we stand now, 12,000 hectares, what to just open the potential of this potential they already have? If we go back in time in South Africa's history, people would not have had title deeds on pieces of paper that were registered in a deeds office. But if they occupied, homesteaded, fenced off and worked a particular piece of land that was identifiably and self-evidently theirs, then that was their land. And if that land was forcibly taken from them, if they were removed from that land unjustly, and if that can be proven, then that is a legitimate land claim as far as I'm concerned. What is an illegitimate land claim is to say that some general territory of land that was unoccupied, that was unhomesteaded in that sense, where they had not fenced it off, protected it, worked it, mixed their labour with it, uh, so to speak. That kind of land cannot just be claimed as owned. One doesn't arrive at a huge piece of land and claim simply by a verbal declaration. You actually have to go and claim land and you have to go and work that land and prove that it is yours by homesteading it, and protecting it and, uh, and, and working that land. What about all the land that are available that are owned by the state? If you put that together, there's more than enough land available to satisfy the demand. It's one of the complete grey areas in the country, but it does seem very ironic that race classification was one of the most iniquitous racially discriminatory laws for which South Africa was pilloried right across the world. And yet we still have an informal system of race classification. By now, race classification could be something which no young South African person has any knowledge of. But this is something which was done to their parents, but which has completely fallen away. If you look at privately owned commercial farms, owned by both black and white private commercial farmers. Most of them are a huge success. Those are the farms that create food security in the country, that gives us uh, food to feed our, our people. Uh, when you go to the situation where land that was expropriated or bought by, by government, according to the Minister of Agriculture himself, he said that 95% of those farms fail. There's a number of reasons for this, but you would see within only a few years there would be a huge 
uh, deterioration in those farms and productivity would stop in most cases totally. What is actually astonishing to see, in many cases these farms are located next to one another and on the one side of the road you would see successful farms, huge productivity and just across the road a farm that was taken by government it would be a dismal failure and the paradox is something that one cannot miss if you look at it. I don't think more than one or two percent of land transferred so far are successfully utilized. In our own part of the world, the Mahuba people, they lost the land before 1914, but still the government were prepared to compensate them or to give them land. And they made a large stretch of land available owned by the tea company and millions of rand went into that project. Nothing came of it. I mean, there are so many examples of failures Government should understand that the present commercial farmers are more than willing to assist new arrivals or whatever in business, let's say uh, the black farmers that come into business. But they need to relook the structure, you know, how you get to success. But it's not just put a person on the land and you will be successful. Even with myself, it took me 10 years before I was in a position to go to my father and said, I think I'm ready now to purchase your farm. I think we should have two sides of this answer. The one is the way where the black farmers have bought the land themselves and they actually apply the production factors on the correct manner to make sure that there will be uh, sustainable production methods on that um, farms. They are successful because the market principles will be the decisive criteria to make sure if a farmer will be a farmer or not. But where the government get involved and they transfer the land to people that is not necessarily a person that apply to that agricultural situation as it should be, then you get all the failures in reality and that is what we experience in South Africa at this stage. Our own Minister of Land Affairs has admitted that as much as 95% of the land reform projects have failed. I think half the problem of our current land reform scheme is that we never ever pick the right beneficiary. Restitution is giving back to those who were unfairly dispossessed. You give them their land, but the government, the government of today must correct the mistakes of the government that went before. And that's why the constitution says you must compensate if you take that land as government. You must do that. Redistribution means you will now give land, not only to one section, you open it up. Anybody who wants to have it, have land, can have it. It's not the question to say, oh, I am Mr. Nguenya, and I must be given land because I am black. That's apartheid in reverse. It's exactly what we were fighting to get rid of. Redistribution is a political concept. It's grounded very much in, in socialism, and it aims, I think, at political goals rather than at goals of justice, whereas restitution, I think, aims at just goals. People, they've got a problem that they are starving. People, they need employment. Those two issues for now are very, very sensitive. If you talk about the land, am I going to eat the land? There was a land that, wa that, that was claimed by the claimants. That land, I can tell you today, is sitting unused. That land, it was very productive before it was given to our people. But then we did not have the implementations. So if we can start to look at that, because ready to come to the land expropriation, how much land that is still unused? How much? It's a lot of land. We cannot now decrease the value of a land because of expropriation without compensation. The food that you are talking about, we are not even going to have it. If people hearing that, they start to go and grab any land, and while they're doing that, they, they loot a lot of things around that land. Now, that cannot bring any peace. Therefore, it cannot bring any development. Because number one, our people are not trained to do the farming. They need to be trained how to do farming. There are some people that are well skillful to do farming, but it's not enough. At the moment, the government's taking the land and it goes to the government. That was never part of the land reform schemes of the past, and uh, it will never succeed. They have to actually back their beneficiaries. When you've picked a guy and you think you've picked the right guy, you must give him the land. And then don't sit there and top him up every year or so because he thinks he can't survive. You must learn how to survive.
That's the only way that you can uh, do land reform in practice and expect it to work. There is no other way. The Free Market Foundation has done some very good analysis and work on township title deeds and, and it would seem that by and large township property structures are basically still apartheid era property structures which is to say that people do not own their properties in townships, people don't have title deeds. Because the ANC has such low regard for private property this has never really been a priority of the present administration which is astonishing because there are people millions of people who occupy and have occupied for many many years land property within townships who uh, really just should own that land. It is rightfully theirs, they've owned and occupied it for many many years, no one else has particular claim on that land. So the Free Market Foundation has done some great work to help township dwellers get title deeds for their property and I think this is a great step forward in land restitution, land justice in South Africa, and really it gets rid of an apartheid era policy. It's the old uh, statist mindset, even Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his uh, French Revolution had the idea that uh, the, the government is a popular government uh, and it represents the people. That becomes the actionable organization in society. And so if you give something to the people, it means you give it to the state. If the state does something, then the state says, no, actually the people did it. So it's absolutely not in government's plan to give land back to private uh, title holders and communities. It is to maintain power over that land and have it seated within the domain of, of the state. There's one thing that I firmly believe in, as you don't change a perception with facts. You could put all the facts on the table, you will never change that. You change a perception with another perception. And the sooner we get to that, that we change perceptions with perceptions, then eventually those people that come into business will be successful. The minute you centralise power, your scope for corruption just increases dramatically and it's a corrupt system that is guaranteed to perpetuate inequality. It's easy to evaluate history from your modern perspective. We look at things different because we have a different set of values and different factors influencing our lives nowadays. But once you look at history, you need to understand where those individuals came from that made certain decisions or why certain things happened because of the situation surrounding them. Geld, national status, politieke macht, politieke behepting. Als die drie bij elkaar komen en hulle verklein met elkaar, dan maak hulle plan om te keer dat die waarheid moet uit. We must still educate and train large numbers of the children of this country, black children, so that they become able to can ask for land from the government to work it and produce and contribute to fruit and like anybody else own as much land as what they can work. The ANC should rid itself from its obsession with race. So-called white commercial farmers are not the enemy. They want to make a contribution to give access to farming opportunities to various communities. The entrepreneurial skills among the black people are huge. What support do they get to grow their businesses? We use them, but they hardly get any support from government to at least get them to develop their entrepreneurial skills to become very competitive in those environments. Land and focusing on skewed land ownership and whites as the problem completely distracts attention from the ANC's own failures in government over so many years. It promised black South Africans a better life for all back in 1994 and yet it's failed on some of its most important responsibilities to improve the schooling system, to improve healthcare, to make sure that we have a rapidly expanding economy, to make sure that we have jobs in the sort of numbers that we need. But all of these failures of governance are now being drowned out by all the focus on land, the possibility of redress, which is a false promise, since the ANC plans the state will own and control the land. And whether this is a good or a bad thing, it's, it's taking now almost the entire attention of the media. And one wonders how easily it will be for opposition parties even to get a hearing on the ANC's failures of governance in the run-up to the next election. It should be very difficult for black and white people to live together, purely based on the fact that uh, the black nation, by each and every day, is becoming more frustrated and more depressed. And the cause for their depression and frustration is uh, being 
inactive in the economy. We are sitting in a ticking time bomb, which might explode at any time if the issue of land is not resolved. Sometimes the question is, what is the right way to solve a problem? We can have a debate and everybody can propose something and we can imagine that some of these will lead to a better outcome. But there's something even easier to be done, and that is what should be stopped. Because sometimes the actions suggested to solve a problem may actually worsen a situation. And even if you don't have a better action, just stopping the current action is probably already going to lead to a better situation. This is the great irony, I think, is that until we actually move beyond the land question, until we deal with it specifically, it will actually sit here and act as a dead weight on the economy. It's easy for us to judge someone living in the Middle Ages for believing the earth is flat, but those were the biggest thinkers of their time, and even that fact could have changed because of technological advancement. So we should not judge people throughout the history of South Africa through our modern lens. We have new opinions and we have new ideas and new influences. We should rather try to look at the world through their eyes, and only then can we really have an idea of what life was like and why certain decisions were made and certain things took place. The Boesman is schuldig ten oor sy volkere in sy land. Vrede, liefde, harmonie, gewijk het. En ons vandag sit met corruptie, diefstal, verkrachting, moord. Ons land is siek. Ek sal die land saam met Lewou bestuur. Ek as boesman sal nooit a wit man, a brein man of a swart man sy waarheid afstree as hy so my sê man, ek het technische kennis hier, ek het wetenskapelike kennis hier, ek het landbouw kennis hier, ek gaan hem niet afstree nie, ek sal hem sê meneer, ek het jou hulp nodig, help my, wees my die pad. You will enrich yourself if you position yourself within the opportunities that are available. There's huge opportunities for black entrepreneurs, black businessmen, black whoever that wants to move into agriculture and understand that they could create their own wealth with the support of the present commercial growers. Don't keep on marginalizing the commercial growers because there's this belief, you know, that we oppress our workers. We do this and that. Go through the exercise then and rate us and categorize us and say, who is prepared. Come and evaluate what we do on our properties and how we incorporate black people in our businesses and invest in them. And those people could eventually have the opportunities to own their own properties. The way market systems work is that they are very, very good at decentralizing knowledge and they essentially thrive on decentralized knowledge. When anyone wakes up in the morning, they are in their particular situation and they have the best idea of what they need to do that day to improve their lives. Whether it's going to their job, trading, looking for work, whatever it is that they plan to do that day, they do it with one goal in common, that by the end of that day, their life is a little bit better than it was when they woke up that morning. This process cannot be centralized. This process is something that each individual has to be in control of because they are the locus of decision making for their own lives. They themselves know their subjective preferences and their choices that they face in a particular day. It's all very well someone from government saying, I don't think that that person should work for less than the minimum wage and therefore I'm going to ban them from, you know, from working for less than the minimum wage. But they don't know the choice set that that particular person faces. That person has chosen to work for less than the minimum wage because any other choice that they face is worse than that choice. So all government has done by banning them from working for less than the minimum wage and therefore from working at all because the employer now won't hire them for, for a higher wage is actually worsen their set of choices and will make it more likely that they go to bed that night in a worse off position than when they started in the morning. We the people of South Africa, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of the past honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land and respect those who have worked and built and developed our country and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to know what the effect of disrespect for property rights 
or an effort to centralize economic decision making would be. All one needs to do is to have a look at the history. The expropriation of land without compensation has been tried. It's been tried in Venezuela, it's been tried in Zimbabwe. And the effect there is for everybody to see. Not only the landowners were negatively affected, what happened is investors, if they're not confident that their property would be safe, they simply don't invest. And if you don't have investments, the economy collapses. We have a government that is trying policies that have failed dismally elsewhere and the problem is with people that, that have a socialist inclination is they never acknowledge these failures they say well we would do it differently and that is why I believe it's in the interest of everybody in our country if we show respect for property rights if we don't try to plan the economy centrally and if we uplift people through policies where we really empower people to participate in the economy uh, rather than handouts. If you're simply going to give people land, you're going to take it away from others without paying for it, it will not stimulate the economy. The same people you want to benefit will be negatively affected in the end.